Lord Waldegrave, because the questions I'm now going to ask are specific questions put forward on behalf of core participants, um, they won't follow a particular chronological or, th or thematic scheme, so we may jump around a little from topic to topic. Um, the first question relates to uh, the response to um, the haemophilia settlement and the, and the £42 million figure. And I've been asked to ask you whether you were aware of disquiet amongst haemophiliacs or the haemophilia society on the level or size of the compromise. And I think I can assist you to answer that question by looking at a couple of documents. I remember the press notice. Yes, exactly. So if we could have, please, um, Lawrence, HSOC 0012313. Um, so this is the press notice of the 11th of December 1990 issued by the Haemophilia Society. The Haemophilia Society today reacted with grave disappointment to the announcement by the government that £42 million is to be made available to people with haemophilia and HIV. Uh, and then Mr Waters, the General Secretary, um, is recorded as observing, we welcome the fact that the government have finally recognised a greater responsibility to people with haemophilia and regret that by deferring that decision for so long, a great deal of personal anguish and suffering has been caused to so many of our members. Um, and then and there is recognition of the role of uh, Mr Major and you. It's a triumph for a caring Prime Minister and Secretary of State for Health. John Major and William Waldegrave are to be applauded for addressing this problem so promptly. It is unfortunate that the settlement has been so low we are naturally very disappointed with the level of the proposed settlement. It means that each of the 217 claimants will receive an average payment of £35,000. I'm not quite sure where that figure comes from, but in any event. And this is a settlement which has been agreed between both the claimants and the government's lawyers and is naturally one which we have to accept. And then um, it continues over the page, but I'm, I'm not going to read the, the rest of it. Um, I, I think it's right that that came to your attention whether or not it was because of the press release, you, I think, received a letter from um, Mr Waters. Yes. Uh, and uh, it, it essentially reflects the uh, concern about what would, would like to have seen more money made available. I, I'm not going to um, put that up on screen. It's DHSC 00036571011. Um, 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 and, and you responded to that, and I think we will briefly put it up on screen and then I'll go back to the question. That's DHSC 0003119 underscore 006. So this was your letter back to Mr Waters of the Haemophilia Society, 18th of Feb 91. On the level of the settlement, um, you say in the second paragraph that the proposals put to us by the plaintiff's solicitors and which have been agreed in principle provide a fair and reasonable resolution of the litigation uh, and then the fourth paragraph you say I realise that no amount of money can ever fully compensate for the tragedy that has befallen those haemophiliacs with HIV and that as in any compromise the amounts made available may fall short of what may have been hoped for However, in total, the government's made available £76 million and ensured that entitlement to social security benefits will not be affected by these payments. We therefore believe we've made very considerable financial provision for the affected haemophiliacs and their families. Um, now, um, I think it would follow you, you were aware at the time of the Haemophilia Society's view that the settlement was too low. Yes, they clearly would have hoped for more. Um, and... Um, did that cause any um, pause, bring about any pause for thought or, or, or reflection or change of approach on the part of the government? Well, I think um, what dominated my mind at the time was, first of all, obviously, that the proposal had come from the, uh, the victims' lawyers. Um, and secondly, some benchmarking against what was happening in other countries. Um, and that, I think, led me and others to think that uh, this was a fair settlement, though clearly, uh, as I say in the letter, not compensation, but a, a, a fair and, um, a settlement which, which st st stood reasonably well in comparison to other countries and to what the lawyers themselves had suggested. And now, if we just leave this on screen, because I'm going to 
ask you another... Just sorry, one yes, other important point, I think, in that letter and throughout. We do say in that letter that although this is a, 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 an out-of-court settlement, we will, however, continue to keep under review the amounts available to the McFarland Trust, which is quite unusual in a, in a settlement of this kind. Uh, and that, I think, in fact, anticipates the next question I was, I was asked to ask you. So you'd mentioned yesterday that, that there was the agreement to pay the £42 million, but mm. the possibility of additional money. Mm -hmm. And as I understand it, that was a reference to the keeping under review the monies that would be made available to the McFarland the Trust. Trust yes. um, and then I was asked to ask you whether that was an announced I in any um, form uh, so that the plaintiffs or their legal representatives would have been aware of it. Th this is a letter to Mr Waters of the Haemophilia Society and, and the paragraph you've just referred to is the last paragraph on this page, the last sentence where you say so we, we I, will, I, however, continue to... I Sorry. think we had made that clear, to, and I, I can't remember whether, of, without looking, whether it was in my written answer, but it was certainly clear, I think, and subsequent events showed that there were further payments. Um. Um, and if we just go to your final written answer, when the final terms yeah. of settlement had been agreed, that's DHSC 00002451 underscore 011. Um, we can see this is the June 1991 yes. um, announcement. Uh, and if we go to the second, um, sorry, the right hand column, please, Lawrence, it's the fourth paragraph down, I think. So, um, uh, I read this out yesterday, I, I, I think, but we mm. um, see there the reference to the 42 million, the reference to the previous sum, and then it says, we are also committed to ensuring that the original McFarlane Trust set up in March 1988 with a government grant of £10 million will continue to be able to give additional help where there is special need. Now, that's not necessarily completely clear, but is that a reflection of the, what you'd said in the letter to Mr Waters, the keeping under review payments to the McFarland yes, Trust. I, I would certainly believe that is so, yes. Um, then uh, we can take that down, thank you. Um, next question picks up on the, the idea of corporate memory. When, when Mrs. Mm. Bottomley, Baroness Bottomley, gave evidence, um, she referred to the turnover of ministers, meaning in the Department of Health, meaning there could be a lack of corporate memory. And, and I think you've referred today to how the corporate memory is essentially held by officials. Mm. Um, and, and the question I'm asked to explore with you is this, does that mean there's a risk um, or a greater risk that officials might become entrenched in a view and not be as open mm. to considering new views. That's a good, good point. I mean, memory can be a fixed doctrine, house doctrine, if you like. Um, I think there are two sides to it. I think officials remembering past issues um, and past arguments is a good thing because ministers, particularly, for example, in my case, come to, to their new portfolio completely cold. But, of course, you can get an entrenched uh, uh, departmental view that it takes a strong minister to change. So there's pluses and minuses. I think, I think forgetfulness is, is bad, but forgetfulness, but, but memory shouldn't merge into uh, fixed doctrine, if, if you like. Um, in your evidence yesterday, um, you... Uh, um, talked about how a response to information from experts about emerging public health issues w could sometimes be, it's just another scare, isn't mm -hmm. it? Mm -hmm. uh, and the question building on that is this, do you think there uh, was or, or is a tendency for politicians to hope that things were not as bad as they in fact were mm. and, and then to go on to hold this as an entrenched view? Or put another way, is there, is there an element of wishful thinking of hoping things will turn out all right? 
I think there are different kinds of personality amongst ministers. Um, my um, uh, children once gave me the little book of gloom by Eeyore for Christmas, and then forgetting that they'd done that, they gave it me again for next Christmas. So I perhaps <coughs> tend to uh, the, the, the gloomier side, but there are some who are tiggers. I think this perhaps is true of, of, of the population at large. I think a certain amount of eoreness is a good thing, however, I would argue, because you, you need to try to imagine the risks that there are out there and, and preempt them if you can. Um, but one mustn't be too gloomy. Um, you, 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 again, in your evidence yesterday, you referred to um, what, what had happened in terms of the, the, the nature and scale of infection from blood and blood products as being one of the greatest catastrophes in the history of the health service. Um, would that not, on any view, um, meet the threshold for a public inquiry? And do you have any understanding of why one was not ordered during the time you were in government? Well, it, it didn't seem to arise in, in my time because the concentration was upon um, trying to find a resource for the victims in my time. I don't remember it, it being suggested in, in my time relatively short in office. I, I agree with the implication of the question um, that a disaster on this scale um, is a perfectly suitable one for a public inquiry. Um, the next question is about government spending more generally. In your experience, um, who really makes the key spending decisions in government? Um, is it um, um, the three candidates in the question, you, you may have more, the Chancellor and Treasury, uh, the civil servants with the corporate memory, or the departmental ministers? It's a bit of all three. Um, I think I did say yesterday that one has to remember that the continuing momentum of government um, gives rather small uh, room for immediate manoeuvre. The, the, as Secretary of State for Health, it's, it's rather odd in some ways that we consider the traditional great offices of state as being the Home Office, the Foreign Office, and so on. The Secretary of State for Health is responsible for a million employees, for the biggest single organization of healthcare, possibly single unified operation of healthcare, perhaps anywhere in the Western world. Uh, it's an immense task. Now, you can't uh, shift, you can't come in and say we're going to shift, I, I think the budget was roughly 30 billion in my day, we're going to switch 5 billion next year to this. It would have meant chaos across hospitals and, and GPs and the whole of the sphere. You've only got a little bit of room for manoeuvre to steer the great, I think Ms. Sir John used this analogy, to steer the, the, the great super tanker in a slightly different way. Um, now, uh, that doesn't mean, and it never should mean, that you can't set priorities and change them. But you can't change them overnight. You, now, uh, coming back to the question, who, who controls this? Well, history, if you like, controls a lot of it. Where you start, you have the health service that you have doing what it's doing when you arrive as Secretary of State for Health. You can't tell those million people, you're all going to be doing something different tomorrow. Uh, chaos ensues. Um, but you can steer it. Now, who has the responsibility for steering it? A government, a strong government that comes in with a mandate uh, will help to steer it very much because the civil servants will say, you have a democratic mandate to do this, and they will start preparing it and shifting it. Um, uh, the, 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 the department that you're trying to shift will say, are you quite sure we've been doing it this way before? That'll mean less of this and more of that. Do you, are you recognizing that it means less of this when you demand more of that? Uh, those are legitimate and important points to raise. And if you're well-founded in your change of direction as a minister, you will be able to, you, you must win it through. But you must also have the support of the officials in the Treasury. The Treasury is organized uh, in the Chief Secretary's Department, in the spending departments, with having little 
very high powered but quite small shadow teams that shadow each department. And um, if they are not convinced either that the government knows what it's doing by shifting to this new priority or they think it's wrong, they will try and stop you. And uh, you will then have to persuade the chief secretary and if you can't persuade him, go to cabinet and chancellor and other ministers would be involved. So it's all, it's all three, I think. Um, uh, and, but I'm one of those who is very averse to the idea that civil servants just overrule ministers all the time. And it's all the, so when you hear a minister blaming the civil service, it's because the minister doesn't know either, either doesn't know what he or she wants or doesn't know, uh, doesn't clarify it enough. The proof of that is that I was part of the introduction of a very bad policy under the Thatcher government, the poll tax. I had a part in that, in the design of that. It was a very bad policy, I think, but it was put to the electorate. It was pursued in all sorts of ways. The government came in with a mandate to do it after the election. The civil servants did it to the best of their ability, though I think to a man or woman, they thought it was the wrong thing to do. So if you know what you want to do, you can get it done in government, and blaming the civil servants is a cop-out. Um, the next question um, just goes back to the HIV litigation and the particular position of Scotland. Um, I'm, if you need me to take you back to any of the documents, I, I, I will, Lord Watergrave, but I think probably we can um, deal with this without, without looking at them. Um, do you agree that the Scottish haemophilia litigation and, and the position of the Scottish litigants was something of an afterthought in the settlement negotiation process? I, I think that probably is a fair characterization. We sorted it out afterwards satisfactorily, but it hadn't been considered before. I think, as I said before, the principal reason for that was the speed with which things were moving. Now, you, you've talked about the, 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 the importance you attached in, in your thinking and your decision making to the advice that that you were receiving, the legal advice that you were receiving about the, the, the merits mm -hmm. of the, the case and, 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 and or respective merits of the case. I think the documentation suggests that the litigation in Scotland was at a less advanced stage. Yes. Um, d does that, combined with the, 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 the way in which the, mm -hmm. the, the negotiations took place, mean ultimately that um, uh, in, in the overall settlement, no separate consideration was given to the merits or potential legal merits of the Scottish litigation? I, I don't, th well, I have to be careful because I, I haven't seen many documents of the Scottish office, but I, uh, Ian Lang is an extremely conscientious minister, a Secretary of State, and I'm sure that if a serious uh, and difficult issues had arisen in Scotland, although it would have caused grave difficulties if they were going to arrive at a position seriously different from the overall UK position, which John Major and I had announced, they would have been considered. So I, I can't really answer in detail, but I, I would be very surprised if um, the, uh, 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 the Scottish office then hadn't, uh, it wouldn't have raised. It, 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 I recall from the papers complicated issues about Category G people, for example. I think that there was consideration given carefully to these issues. Um, you've, you've explained as a matter of fact that the issue of um, giving uh, any form of financial support to those infected with hepatitis C was not something which um, you gave any particular consideration mm. Two. So the, the, the question I've been asked to raise with you is, is why that was the case. Why do you think that the department um, that, that you were not looking at the position of those infected with hepatitis C, given that, in parallel, the department at least was aware that um, the issue of screening was, was under consideration in recognition of the fact that this was a serious condition. Mm. I, I can't give a, a, a real answer to that because the, the, the issues just never came before me. And I think if I start to make up plausible arguments, I shall, I shall not give a good answer. Um, the, the next question is, is this. If 
the litigation had not settled and had been fought to trial and the plaintiffs had succeeded, from which pot would the damages and costs have come? Department of Health, Reserve or somewhere else? Uh, a lot of ifs, but uh, they would have um, probably come from the... Uh, I don't know. I'd have to think of whether... I don't honestly know. It depends how much it was and so on. Um, uh, I imagine the Secretary of State for Health having lost that case, if, I'd, if, if it had gone to court and we'd lost and there was some uh, uh, very large uh, bill, I would certainly have tried to get it from the Reserve, I'm sure. Um, but, but in other cases, of course, smaller cases where, because there were negligence cases that were won against the, the health service, uh, all the time, they, they normally came out of the the uh, budget of the health service under under Duncan Nicol. But I think if there had been a huge defeat like that, it, the new money would have had to be found from somewhere, and probably there is there. Um, is there room in government? Is, this is the next question, an entirely unrelated question, for um, some form of devil's advocate to challenge and test received wisdom, particularly where there is a risk of groupthink and entrenched views. Yes, and there's been a development over in recent years on this, it seems to me, if I understand it rightly, by the establishment of the, they're always referred to in the newspapers as SARS, I don't know why, particularly as they're mostly SARinas, but um, uh, independent, they're civil service offices, they're, but they're independent commissioners with a with a, a championing a championship right. My youngest daughter works for the children's commissioner. I think those are rather good developments where they're, they're part of of Whitehall, but they're independent and they're meant, as I understand it, to raise the issues for their area. So that would that's one way of meeting that rather sensible suggestion, which has happened in recent years. There may be more to be done in that way. Parliament is, of course, supposed to do it. And there are wonderful MPs. Um, the great Frank Field, in the course of his long life, has been a wonderful campaigner for a whole range of issues. Uh, um, my late friend, um, Tam Diel, was a one-man um, campaigner on all manner of issues um, and, and representative of all manner of unpopular causes. <laughs> so there are great MPs who do this, but I think the institutionalization of it in the commissioners is probably a, a good step. The last question is, is this. Uh, we've explored in some detail how, as a matter of fact, the decision-making was taken both in relation to the settlement of the HIV haemophilia litigation and then to the um, extension of the, of the ring fence, so to speak, to, to uh, pr provide financial support to those infected through transfusion. Um, and you've talked about the response to campaigning and mm -hmm. a sense of a moral case. There were the financial reputational considerations and so on. Were there any underlying principles guiding the department um, uh, according to, to shape the decision-making about who might get financial support and who might not? Well... Um one has to remember, of course, that they were responsible, the department was responsible for the whole of national health care. And there were thousands and thousands and thousands of other uh, uh, responsibilities that they had to ensure. I gave the example of one that was always coming up and causing problems and causing huge press campaigns sometimes, which were new drugs, um, very expensive often coming from America, but often promising great benefits. Um, and what were the principles? Well, the principles, can, can I say this? I, th I think that most of the officials in the health department were there by choice. They, they, they wanted to work in healthcare, particularly the more senior ones. They, had the, they have some steerage over where their careers go. They were interested in the issues of public health and they were very knowledgeable about them. And they worked all hours of the day and night trying to advance them. I think their principles were were what one would have thought. How do we 
do the best for the public health of the country with the limited amount of money we've got. That's not, I don't know whether that's a very good answer, but it's the nearest I can give, I think. I don't think there was any separate morality. I don't believe in a separate morality of government. There isn't such a thing as a raison d'etat. That's just morality. And there was no such thing as a separate morality for the Department of Health. It was trying to do its best with li always limited resources for the health of the nation, which is what we called our campaign. Um, and on the whole, they, they did it conscientiously, I think. Um, uh, would it have in regard to the material mm. we've looked at be right to understand then that obviously there the were cases where um, there might be negligence mm. and, and mm. legal liability mm. and so compensation might follow in, mm. in those cases. There was the policy against no-fault compensation. Mm -hmm. And then in terms of the, the, the circumstances mm. in which the department might provide financial assistance mm. of some form to those um, who didn't fall into the mm. category of establishment of legal liability. Mm. But there, were no, mm. there, were no, there was no established policy I or principle guiding how those right. decisions would be taken. It was a response to, uh, on a somewhat ad hoc basis, to... Uh, I think so, because there were quite different kinds of considerations which merged. For example, there had been the, the uh, vaccine-damaged children case where there was the overriding importance um, uh, of maintaining the, conf the confidence of people in the vaccine program, and that if the confidence waned, there would be measurable deaths. And it, it, the risk, it was an easier risk uh, calculation in a way. And that's brought home to me by, when I was Secretary of State for Health, we had the first year ever, I think, where no child died of measles. That is no longer so because of disgraceful attacks on the MMR vaccine. So, um, but, and that, uh, so what I'm saying in an elaborate way is I think they were right to deal with the, the vaccine damaged children, but it was a different kind of issue than, so that the, rather difficult to predict. I think, I think you couldn't make a sort of a paradigm which would fit every case. I, it's back to what I, tried to say yesterday, but I think that's the job of the Secretary of State, uh, to, to look at the cases and say, this is one where we've got to do something special. And, and then, so this is, I think, the final question. It's when I omitted to ask um, um, a few minutes ago and meant to. Just goes back to the, 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 the nature and timing of the announcement that was made by John Major and by you on the 11th of December, 1990. Um, D did you understand when the announcement was made um, that it would be taking place in circumstances which would lead to many of the individual plaintiffs learning for the first time of the proposals from the media? Um, I, I, I knew that the proposals had come from the uh, uh, plaintiffs' council and lawyers. Um, and that there'd been interaction with the steering committee, um, so that I knew, we all knew, I think, that not every, every um, victim uh, had been informed of what the lawyers for the plaintiffs were recommending, if that's a, an answer to that, a slightly roundabout answer to that question. But it, I suppose the, it's inevitable um, that they would have, uh, in, the, in the speed with which we moved, have heard about it in many cases from the media, yes. And, and having regard to that and, and what might have been the impact upon individuals finding out about the proposals only in, in that way, almost, a, as it were, a, a deal done behind their backs, it might be seen by, 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 by some. Um, d d looking back, do you think that... Uh, the government may have jumped the gun in making the announcement when they did? No, I, I would go back to what I said yesterday, that I believe that there was a, a moment in time where a deal was doable, which was, in the terms of the time, a fair deal, and that if we missed that opportunity, we'd be back in a situation, the awful situation of just um, proceeding on to litigation and, and nightmare. So those are the questions I'm proposing to ask from those put forward by core participants. I'm going to check them. Ms. Gray has no questions of her own.
Uh, yes, well, I, I just have, have one area to, to ask you about. It really arises out of your reflective comments at the very end uh, of the questioning before the, we had the break this morning, um, coupled with your description of yourself as an Eeyore more than a trigger, a tigger. Um, and it's, it's this. Does part of your um, idea that there should be openness in policy analysis by government uh, extend to what might colloquially be, be put as the government being straight with people in the information it gives? Of course, yes. I think that the, the, the loss of, of confidence in government if, if people question the, the, the data, they may question the policy analysis built on it, but if they think the government is, to use a straightforward word, lying to them about the data, then that is a very serious matter in a democracy, I think. A accepting that, uh, there may be matters short of, of lying. Let me uh, give you one example which may, uh, may yet come uh, to, to, for me, for final decision. There is material uh, before me in relation to this inquiry uh, which uh, means, or might mean, it's evidence to the effect that uh, by March um, 1982, it was known that there was a possible risk, possible cause uh, of AIDS was transmission by blood. By the middle of 1982, it, it was regarded as a substantial possibility to the extent that it might well be thought to be the likeliest cause. By the end of 1982, the general consensus seems to have been, um, on the evidences so far before me and, and reflected in the medical press at the time, uh, that it was perhaps indeed the likeliest cause. Uh, and that went on strengthening. It, it was the view we were being told by Dr. Wolford of the, uh, the department. Uh, when ministers uh, referred to the risk uh, of getting or the possibility of transmission by AIDS, the, what was said was, and no more than, uh, there was no conclusive proof that blood transmitted the cause of AIDS. It, it may be submitted to me at the end of uh, the inquiry, when call participants have a right to make submissions, that that was a deliberate obfuscation of the truth. They may go that far. It might be said to the other side uh, that it was a deliberately chosen words so as not to uh, not to be technically untruthful because it, conclusive is a strong word, no conclusive proof, uh, but to avoid panicking the public. What would your reaction be to that? Um... My first reaction is that I'm glad, Sir Brown, that I don't have to make the, 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 your job <laughs> to make the judgment. Um, I, it, it's, I, I would, again, have to immerse myself. In, I, I want to be careful not to appear on the basis of really no first-hand investigation to, to condemn anybody. Um, but... Uh, 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 it's a very difficult judgment ever to say in science that something is um, certain. <laughs> and it's that difficulty which I think um, affects quite a lot of... I, I remember my colleague John Gummer being much criticised at the beginning of the, C, the BSE crisis for giving, having his film giving his child a, a hamburger. Um, I thought the criticism, in a sense, was unfair. He was saying, this is certain as far as we know, and it's certain to the extent that I am behaving in, within my own family as if it is certain. Now, I, I don't know that one wants to involve one's children in politics, but 
he was trying to make the point that it was certain within the bounds of reasonable uh, action. Um, but uh, uh, um, I, I, I think those judgments around probability and certainty of, of science are one of the most difficult areas any minister has to face. I, I'm not sure I can give you a better answer than that without myself spending the energy to look back at what they were, what, what the situation was then. But the, the principle which mm. uh, I should apply, mm. as you would see it, mm. uh, would be that the government should be open uh, as far as its analysis is concerned and shouldn't hide uh, any facts yes. on the public. What, what you can't do, what you shouldn't ever do, uh, I think, is hide the, analysis, the scientific analysis it is coming to you because they will be, the government has very good scientists working for it, but sometimes scientists outside will say, will want to say you've got the balance wrong or you've made a mistake or there, is, there are other considerations here. You've, you've got to protect yourself against that and it goes a little bit back to, to, to what we were talking about earlier about being willing to make mistakes in this area of factual analysis, you've got to follow the great saying of Maynard Keynes, when the facts change, I change my mind. Thank you very much. Lord Watergrave, was there anything that you wished to add? Yes, um, briefly. Um, um, I'm um, grateful and, and um, impressed by the questions coming from the uh, core participants. Um, perhaps I could say a few words which are really directed um, to them as much as to anybody else, which is to say this, that in the 18 months or so that I was Secretary of State for Health, I did not find anybody, in my judgment, either of those I agreed with or those who very vehemently disagreed with me, who did not act in good faith. Um, we were wrestling with difficult problems, and I believe that the decisions we took, whether right or wrong, were taken in good faith. But second, um, we did change the policy in the teeth of to pay what was then seemed, and I certainly take the question that was put to me as uh, whether this is adequate, but was then seemed a fair settlement at the t in the terms of the time. I'm glad that the door remained open for further uh, for further support, and I'm very glad that this inquiry may be able to do a great deal more. Um, but I think we were right in what we did then, and I'm also pretty sure that it wouldn't have happened without um, a, a kick or two from me. Finally, um, and this goes, Sir Brown, to what you've been saying, I think that the the confidence which we all need to maintain in our health service is best served in the light of tragedies like this by openness about the causes of them. Because only if we take the steps to reassure people that we've learned the lessons will that vital confidence be maintained. Could I finally say, Bran, on a completely different note, that um, I'd like to have on record Thanks for the um, efficiency and courtesy of the staff of the inquiry, and if I may name one person of Laura. Thank you, Lord Watergrave. Sir Brian. Uh, I, I, I can simply say uh, first that uh, Laura fully deserves what you've said publicly uh, about her, and I simply uh, recognise that now uh, she may be listening and blushing. Um, if so, it's appropriate. But can I, um, in particular, uh, thank you for your evidence. It, the, you've given us, I think, a fascinating uh, insight I into how policy can be made by one person um, having a, 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 an idea uh, as to what is right and what is not, uh, and how that idea can be progressed through to a conclusion and the various different pressures uh, that 
uh, my apology, the, the turning of the super tanker or the adjustment of the steering wheel, um, uh, as you've described it. Uh, so thank you very much for that um, fascinating insight. Uh, sir, tomorrow we have a presentation on the role of the chief medical officers, particularly in the 1980s. So tomorrow, 10 o'clock.